We're going to move on now to uh, Saskia McCracken and Mark McGregor from the South Glasgow Heritage and Environmental Trust, who will talk to us about South Glasgow's heritage and legacies of slavery. South Glasgow Heritage and Environment Trust it exists to research, preserve and maintain the rich heritage environment of Glasgow's South Side. They're currently running a project on the legacies of slavery in the South Side, which includes blogs, a forthcoming article in History Scotland, and a digital map with short histories on relevant buildings, heritage sites, and individuals involved in the transatlantic slave trade. You're very welcome, Saskia and Mark. Over to you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll just give a very quick trigger warning that of course we're talking about slavery but I'm also going to refer to rape in this talk as well. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how I can minimize this so that I can still see my page. There we go. Um, so um, as you've heard we're South, South Glasgow Heritage and Environment Trust. We're dedicated to the history of South Glasgow and we're currently running a project on legacies of slavery in the South Side. Today, we're going to give a quick overview of how South Glasgow's heritage sites, or crime scenes, as Graham Campbell has helpfully put it, were shaped by powerful families involved in the transatlantic slave trade. We will show that while people make Glasgow, enslaved people made Glasgow, including South Glasgow, the place it is today. And it's important to understand this aspect of our history if we're going to come to terms with the racial violence underpinning Scotland's cultural heritage. So first I'm going to talk about Glasgow's golden age of sugar, and then my colleague Mark will discuss the tobacco lords who shaped South Glasgow. Slide please. Slide please. Hello. Great, thank you. So that's Pollock House there. Um, and there's a newer version of Pollock House. So, the Sterling Maxwells of Pollock were one of the most eminent families in South Glasgow. Pollock House opened in 1752. So John Sterling Maxwell, 10th Baronet, opened the estate to the public in 1911 and also gifted land that now contains Maxwell Park and Pollock Shields Borough Hall to the Borough of Pollock Shields in 1887. After he died in 1956, his daughter Anne gifted Pollock House, his vast art collection, library, and 361 acres of surrounding land to the city of Glasgow. The wealth of these philanthropists and others in the South Side came in part from Glasgow's golden age of sugar and the transatlantic slave trade. Slide, please. Archibald Sterling the Elder from the Sterling side of the family tree made his fortune in Jamaica. The 1750 mortgage from one of his estates, which you can see in the Mitchell Library, includes a list of enslaved people attached to that estate. Archibald Sterling the Younger was also a planter on these estates and was awarded over 12,000 pounds, which is up to over 57 million pounds today, for 960 enslaved people after the abolition of slavery. He then returned to Scotland and married Elizabeth Maxwell of Pollock, who was descended from St Kitt's plantation overseer, Sir James Maxwell of Pollock. One of their sons uh, became William Sterling Maxwell, ninth baronet of Pollock and the University of Glasgow's Dean and Chancellor, whose £3,000 bequest is detailed in the University Slavery Report. Archibald Sterling the Younger, however, also had six illegitimate children. We know little about them, but one, called Edward Sterling, had a mother who was a Creole woman of colour, possibly called Jean. It is likely that these illegitimate children were the result of Sterling raping enslaved women, and that these children were denied the profits made through the labour of their enslaved ancestors. The history of the Sterling Maxwells, then, is bound up in the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. Slide, please. Um, so on this slide, you can see uh, Sterling Maxwell on the right and um, Henry Edward Clifford on the left. Following slide, please. Henry Edward Clifford, who designed Pollock Shields Borough Hall in Maxwell Park, was born in Trinidad to a father who supervised a sugar plantation. After the father's death, the family moved to Pollock Shields, where they lived on Nithsdale Road and then at 12 Moray Place. 
he named two of his buildings in Scotland Woodbrook House after the Trinidad estate and evidently remembered his time in the Caribbean fondly. Slide, please. Um, this is another one of his constructions. And then the following slide after that. Thank you. Cathkin House in the Rutherglen area was designed by architect James Ramsey and built in 1799 for Jamaica sugar merchant, Walter Ewing Maclay. His brother, James Ewing, was considered one of the founders of Glasgow's West India trade. Humphrey Ewing Maclay, I'm sorry, there are so many names that are kind of the same here, so it's easy to get lost, but Humphrey Ewing Maclay, who inherited Cathkin House and the Jamaica Estates, was also named as a factor of a Jamaica slave ship in 1801. And he was awarded what amounts to over 40 million today in compensation for the freedom of 449 enslaved people. Slide, please. We now move on to Bella Houston Park, known for Charles Rennie Mackintosh's house for an art lover. The park once contained farmland and was on the Maxwell estate, which included Pollock Park. In 1824, linen merchant Moses Stephen of Palmody bought the Bella Houston estate. Stephen was a partner of Buchanan, Stephen & Co, a West Indies firm. His son, also Moses, inherited the estate, bought Dumbreck House and renamed it Bella Houston House, slide please. And his sisters then inherited this estate and sold part of it in 1892 to Glasgow Corporation for Bella Houston Park. When they died, the Bella Houston bequest was granted to organizations including the University of Glasgow and Glasgow Museums, which holds Stephen's portrait. Slide please. Yet another site, Orbiston House in Bells Hill, belonged to a sugar merchant, Gilbert Douglas, of the Mount Pleasant Sugar Plantation and the Fairfield Cotton Estate in St Vincent. In the early 1800s, he bought land at Douglas Park and on the banks of South Calder Water. This became Douglas Park and Boggs Estate. He built a mansion on the site of Old Orbiston House with the profits of his sugar plantations and slave labor. His widow, Cecilia Douglas, inherited the estate and plantations and was compensated what amounts to over 7 million today for 231 enslaved people. Her art collection now belongs to Glasgow Museums and you can see the stained or tainted glass window memorializing the Douglas family in Glasgow Cathedral. Orbiston House was damaged by a fire in 1919 and demolished in 1931. Much of the estate land is now part of Strathclyde Country Park. Next slide, please. Um, and finally from me, Semple Estate, including Semple Castle at the edge of Clyde, Clyde Muirshield Regional Park, is a little bit outside of South Glasgow, but it's, it's still part of um, Scotland's um, sugar heritage. This, um, this castle was demolished and rebuilt by West Indies planter William McDowell around 1727. He also transported forcibly and sold Africans into slavery. He held at least one enslaved person at Semple Estate, presumably at this castle that we can see. Um, next slide, please. And we know this because a notice was published in the Glasgow Quran on the 1st of February, 1748, which offered sufficient reward for capturing a runaway called Cato. Let us not forget that South Glasgow's prosperity came in great part from the forced labor of enslaved individuals like Cato. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Mark McGregor. So next slide, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. So um, I'll just be talking about the um, tobacco uh, lords. And much like the uh, sugar merchants, a lot of the tobacco merchants uh, used a lot of their um, wealth to purchase land in the outskirts of the city including to the south of the river. Um, some of the, the houses that were built on these estates remain, but um, many more were demolished. Um, just in kind of urban expansion or somewhere more, just by the cityscape. Nevertheless, um, these houses uh, afforded the merchants a degree of disconnect and perhaps some anonymity uh, from the trade itself. Uh, one such house, 
that no longer exists is this one in Craigton. It was demolished during the interwar period uh, to make way for housing. But this was bought in uh, 1746 by James Ritchie, who was one of the four young men of the tobacco trade in Virginia. Um, James Ritchie was also one of the people who established the Thistle Bank. Now, looking at compensation records following 1833, um, we can see that his son, Henry Ritchie, um, who had taken over the property in 1830, um, was compensated along with uh, James Maxwell Sterling and William Sterling um, in a joint claim. They received £4,000, which in today's money is £380,000, for loss of 210 enslaved people. Uh, of that, uh, Richie received around about a quarter. Next slide, please. So um, we've heard about um, Shawfield, uh, Shawfield Mansion, which is in the city centre. However, there was also Shawfield Estate and the house, uh, which was owned by uh, Daniel Campbell, who was an MP, uh, perhaps also famous for being one of the signatories of the um, uh, 1725 uh, malt tax, which resulted in his mansion being ransacked. However, um, the Shaw Shawfield Estate uh, sits near uh, Palmyre, just kind of close to Rutherland. Um, he made money in the early tobacco trade in the pre-union era, the uh, pre-active union era, um, and he was also involved in the direct trading of slaves. Uh, this house was pulled down in the 1960s after the nearby land was contaminated by the chemical works. So next slide, please. So. Uh, this is Shield Hall, which is um, around about where the Queen um, Elizabeth University Hospital is. Um, built in 1720, it was owned by Alexander Oswald in 1781. So although as Oswald himself was a sugar trader, he also was one who pride himself in not directly employing himself in the slave trade. However, much of his wealth um, came from his family ties in the tobacco trade, and that was through relatives George and Richard Oswald. Um, the latter being the notorious merchant and slaver who um, was partially owner of Man's Island, I believe. So, although the connection can be argued to be tenuous at points, uh, Alexander uh, wouldn't have procured that property if it wasn't for the tobacco trade and this um, slavery was connected to it. So, next slide, please. So can I just, uh, next slide again, actually, because this is pertinent. So um, this one here is Green Bank House, and this is still standing. Um, it's surrounded by picturesque gardens and is owned by the National Trust. Um, it's near Clarkston in East Renfrewshire. Um, the visitors may, be, may not be aware of Robert Allison, um, who built and owned the house. Um, he began as a baker, and a trader in Port Glasgow, which was an introduction um, to the tobacco trade. And he managed to build a tobacco empire with his three brothers, Sandy, William and David. And there's some research conducted by Stuart Nisbet and Tom Welsh, um, which shows references to um, quote, the Guinea trade among Allison's personal correspondence. Further records show which name Allison directly himself, um, that he funded um, vessels used to transport up to a thousand people from West Africa to the Caribbean. Uh, letters from his brother also suggest that these voyages were a fairly significant um, source um, of his income. So the wealth amassed from that was used to purchase Green Bank House and the gardens that surround it. And as I said, it's now owned by the National Trust and to their credit, they have been fairly open um, about the ground's links to the slave trade, and it's even got a mention on its website. So I think just the final slide, and I'll wrap up. So Scotland's historic links uh, to slavery can be found in its heritage, heritage sites, powerful families and merchants, and the south of Glasgow here, no different. From these estates, businesses grew, and subsequently, so did the area that surrounded them. So the legacy of slavery in the south side of Glasgow can be learned through 
just paying attention to the history of its parks and its houses and also its place names. Right, that's, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Saskia and Mark. That was really interesting. And particularly as a South Sider myself, it's uh, enlightening and, and pretty depressing to find out how entrenched the legacies are in the area which I've lived for all of my time in Scotland.